Welcome to Cooking with Science. I'm Todd Silver, your host. Today we're at the U.S. Arboretum, which is just outside the nation's capital. They're open every day except for Christmas, and there's tons to see here, including the Washington Youth Garden and the National Herb Garden, which has over 900 different types of plants. So today I'm really excited to have two great guests with me. The first is uh, Chef Jessica. She is the chef instructor of the Hospitality Management Program at Montgomery College in Rockville, Maryland. And Jessica, please introduce yourself and tell us what you do there. Thank you. Um, so I, uh, I teach our food production and catering and banquets labs in the Hospitality Management Program. So the courses in our program that actually take place in our kitchens. Um, I also teach our Intro to Hospitality program or course. Okay. So prior to coming to Montgomery College and um, during my career in hospitality, um, I've worked in Italian fine dining restaurants in Washington, D.C., New York City, uh, Miami, Florida, and uh, opened a bunch of restaurants um, and have kind of always gone back and forth between being in the restaurant and uh, being in the classroom. Um, so education is uh, a big passion. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, on the science side today, we have Dr. Thomas Bjorkman. And uh, Thomas, if you uh, tell us a little bit about what you do at Cornell in upstate New York. Yeah, so at Cornell, I'm at the horticulture department, which is specializing in fruits and vegetables. And so my area is in vegetable physiology and production. And so growing vegetables with better quality and growing them in ways that are more environmentally sustainable. And so buckwheat, it turns out, is not so much an agronomic crop as it is a horticultural crop. And so that ended up being part of my portfolio. Which is really interesting that most people think of, of buckwheat as a grain, but it's not a grain. It's more of a it's vegetable. It's not a grain. It grows much like a bean plant does. And so when the farmers grow it, it's like a vegetable. And by the time it gets to Chef Jess, it's a, a grain. Okay, <laughs> so let's talk about this vegetable grain. So what are we making today? <laughs> well, uh, we are gonna be making a buckwheat mal tagliati, which is a pasta that we're making with a combination of buckwheat flour and uh, a wheat flour um, and eggs and a little bit of extra virgin olive oil. We're gonna roll that out by hand and then we're gonna cut that into mal tagliati, which means in Italian, badly cut. Badly cut, okay. So it's perfectly imperfect. I'm good, okay, I can handle that. That sounds good <laughs> to me. Okay, and then we're also doing a pasta dish as well, the, So sauce. we're gonna use that pasta um, uh, and we're gonna toss that in a, a bean and miso and mushroom kind of ragu, if you will, uh, with a little bit of uh, dulce seaweed. Okay. And before you get started, um, you brought a friend with you behind me. So do you wanna <laughs> introduce your, your friend here? Yes, this is our rolling raptor food truck. Uh, so the Rolling Raptor is a food truck that we use in our food truck entrepreneurship course. Um, and our students uh, in that course have an opportunity to develop a business plan for a food truck business and then uh, test it out um, throughout the, the course. Wonderful. Okay. I know there's going to be a line of people waiting to get into the food truck later. So let's start with what so you're doing here. So we better get making pasta then, Yeah, I exactly. Because we've got some hungry people coming out. Okay. So we're ready to go. So we've got, uh, here we have our, this is Italian double zero flour. So this is a finely milled wheat flour. So this pasta recipe um, uh, is not gluten-free, though buckwheat uh, is gluten-free. Uh, so you could make a version of this pasta gluten-free. You'd have to obviously make some adjustments to the uh, flours that you're using, but you could make an all buckwheat or a buckwheat and um, another starch um, version of this. Okay. And the zero, double zero is the fineness of the flour? Yeah, this is, um, it's basically, if you can't find double zero flour, you can find it in most grocery stores, but the, just use all purpose. Okay. Um, so, uh, we're going to mix this dough, uh, and I've got two eggs here, which I'm just, uh, going to crack into this bowl. Okay. Oops. I like to crack them in the bowl first in case I accidentally, uh, get some shells in there. There we go, okay. And you could mix this by hand. Um, we're just gonna quickly mix it in the food processor, which okay. is, if I'm not mixing it by hand, is my favorite way of making it. Uh, you could also mix it in a stand mixer, um, but this is, uh, this is an easy way to do it. Okay, all set. Uh, so I'm gonna add my two different flours in there. Okay. Got my buckwheat and my double zero. 
And I'm uh, gonna add in my eggs here. And then um, to give the dough a little bit of suppleness, uh, a little bit of fat, I like to put in some extra virgin olive oil. Okay. Just a drizzle. Eh, a little bit more of a drizzle. There you go. And then we'll put this back on and pulse this up. And the dough will come together pretty quickly. Okay. And while you're pulsing, uh, Thomas, tell us about buckwheat. So you have a lot going on over here. Uh, what, do, what can you show us here? Well, if we look from the farmer's field to the restaurant, this is the buckwheat grain as it comes from out of the field after it's been cleaned of all the little sticks and stuff. Okay. But that has the hull on it, which is dark. Uh, and that part is completely indigestible. So that's usually dehulled and you get the the groat we call that part okay and so this is it? so this is the whole fruit and this is just the seed okay. inside the fruit and so this is what's typically used to make uh, flour and other ingredients from the buckwheat in eastern europe um, it's eaten as kasha so it's roasted so this is a much darker color because it's been roasted okay and so kasha is roasted buckwheat then. that is basically it um, and it's eaten whole you can cook that uh, like you would rice or, or bulgur or something and have it as the savory starch in in a, your main meal but it's also done as a porridge and so you'd granulate it a little bit like this okay. and then it ends up being a porridge those are our important staple crops uh, this is a typical buckwheat flour that you would get here and so it is a little gray there's some little black speckles in there because there's a little bit of hull in there that's the tradition for buckwheat flour in the united states so that's what we typically see uh, in the olden days when this this area was full of grist mills uh, and they would all grind but they weren't that good at it right. they would get bigger chunks of hull in it and so this uh, modern day rustic buckwheat flour is what they ate here as, as buckwheat in, in Maryland and parts north. And this much lighter flour is just the whole hull, so it has the seed coat on it. Um, but this is what's often used for buckwheat ingredients where uh, you want a cleaner kind of a flour and so less of the rustic character, uh, but more of the uh, sort of culinary characteristics. Okay. And um, so you can use either one they taste about the same. They have different colors. And so we see here that uh, I'm using Chef the, Jess is yeah. yes, not needing a great lump, <laughs> <laughs> but needing something with a very attractive color. And so Jessica is using this grain right here, not grain, That's th right. this buckwheat. That's right, the finely milled with, that, with the whole, basically the hulled buckwheat okay. kernel. Yeah. So I'm just kneading this because even if you use the machine, you still got to get your hands on the dough. Okay. Um, so we're going to knead that until um, it's nice and uh, smooth. There is some wheat flour in here, so we are trying to develop that gluten a bit. Okay. And um, once I knead that, uh, I'm going to wrap that up in a little bit of plastic and let it rest for about 30 minutes okay. uh, before we roll it out. You can also... Um, Make this dough in advance, a day or two, keep it in the fridge, and then bring it to room temperature before you roll it out again. Uh, I even like to freeze my doughs. Okay. So, um, so I have one that I've already rested. Perfect. Um, Saves us and, 30 minutes. <laughs> and you can see uh, that during the resting time, uh, the dough becomes much more hydrated. Um, so that's what we want. And we're ready uh, to roll this out. We're going to roll this by hand, okay. uh, but you could also um, roll it out using a uh, crank, hand crank pasta machine. Uh, some folks have the attachment for their stand mixer that works really well. So whatever you, whatever you have, okay. uh, you can use. Whatever you fancy. Whatever, whatever you. I like to use the rolling pin. Um, this dough is uh, really rolls out really nice and easy. So. It's no problem um, to roll it with a pin. Okay. Well, while you're rolling, uh, Thomas, let me ask you, um, what are the health benefits of buckwheat? So why should I consume buckwheat or eat it, put it in my diet? Well, the main reason is probably that it comes from a different group of plants, the rhubarb family, 
than anything else you're eating, especially the grains. So it contains a lot of different nutrients and phytochemicals that wouldn't otherwise be part of your diet. So it helps diversifying your diet. That's the easiest way to be healthy is to eat a very diverse diet. So it adds that diversity. Even in, in U.S. history too, right? In, in the colonial and, and just post-colonial area, parts of Pennsylvania and New York that are now mostly forests were uh, buckwheat farms. All right, how we're looking so here? So we're looking pretty good. I'm rolling, I'm attempting to roll this into a, a rectangle. We're gonna take it to about eight, an eighth of an inch. Okay. And we're just kind of thinning out the center and uh, I'm kind of rotating it around so that we get some, some evenness uh, throughout. That looks good. So Thomas, let me, let me ask you while we're watching the rolling here, um, what are the major challenges that you see uh, buckwheat, buckwheat growers are facing? So the biggest challenge is getting a, a reliable yield, that the yields go up and down, sometimes for reasons we understand well and sometimes for reasons we don't understand at all. So there's more risk involved. It's part of my job in advising the farmers is to help them match the the day length and the kind of season we're having and timing of planting and when to harvest, a lot of details like that so that they don't lose yield to things we understand. Is, is having a shorter season better for them or is that uh, They require a, a short season and not too hot. It's the shortest season from planting to harvest of any grain type crop we have. So it grows, you know, Siberia, North Dakota, places with very short seasons or high elevations in Italy. Uh, it, but it is also very frost sensitive. So it's challenging to grow here because it's way too hot right now. It doesn't like it. But by the time it cools off, it's almost too cold. And yeah. so there's just not a lot of slot in the, in the fall, which is why we tend to grow it further north. Oh, okay, okay. All right, we're almost there. But we're looking for about an eighth of an inch thickness. Okay. You can see uh, the thinness or thickness of the dough. Yeah. Uh, kind of by holding it up, you can see where you need to work a little bit more on the on the rolling. Okay. So we're going to focus on those areas that we need, but not too thin. And what I love about this flower is, though, even though it's still it's it's the hull is mostly removed, it's not completely removed. Mm -hmm. So you get some of the speckled. Um, it gives color, it a really nice, nice, yeah, nice character to it. Yep. This. I think my issue is I don't have the patience for that, for the <laughs> right. rolling. So I need to have more patience <laughs> gotta, to make sure it's more to, uniform. You need pasta therapy. Yeah. It's good. <laughs> yeah, so I'll, well, pizza right. dough always looks right. a little lumpy right. in certain parts. Yeah. And again, it's never a square. It always tastes good though, right? It, it tastes fine, yeah. <laughs> I don't get any complaints. Okay, so malta yati, um means badly cut. Yep. So we're going to be badly cut, but not too bad. I, you, we, we still have a little, um, you know, a little bit of uh, consistency or um, accuracy that we want to get. So okay. I like to use my roller cutter. Okay. In Italian, we call this a bicicletta. Um, and so I'm looking at about a two and a half inch uh, thickness on all of the roller cutters. Okay. So we'll just go up like this, okay. up like that. And we're not so, again, we're not super concerned with perfection. It's a bad um, cut, it's okay. Right? It's, ba it's <laughs> badly fine. cut. Um, but then we can, you can stack them and cut them. They do have an interesting color to them too, than uh, what it's, you see in a normal It's beautiful, pasta. isn't it? It is, yeah kind of similar to what you might expect from a whole wheat. Yeah. Um, and you could totally make this with whole wheat. Okay. Well. I like the way you could see almost, I guess those are the grains in there yeah. too. So uh, what I like to do is just, basically you're just kind of, you get like triangles. Okay. And then these can all go right onto your parchment that I've sort of uh, sprinkled with a little bit of um, semolina flour, which is a kind of a coarse flour that will keep the pasta from sticking together. Okay. So Thomas, let me ask you about um, your research. So what research are you focusing on right now? 
So I'm trying to focus on efforts to have the buckwheat be more reliable for production, uh, and particularly for growers in the specific area where it's being grown now in the Northeast. Uh, and one of the things we're finding is the temperatures are in the fall are getting higher. Our season has extended by several days, and in some locations even more than that, just in the 25 years or so that I've been dealing with it. So we're seeing opportunities such as planting buckwheat after the wheat harvest, which hasn't been possible before, and having all the wheat farmers be able to raise buckwheat would really increase the amount uh, being produced and start trying to meet the great demand that there is for it right now. Okay. All right. So there's a couple of elements. So the first we're going to make, a, we're basically going to make a miso compound butter. Okay. Uh, so we have our butter that's softened here. We're just going to put it together in this bowl, kind of break, break that down really easily. And to that, we're going to add a little bit of miso paste. And this is a, um, this is a miso that is made with chickpeas. Mm. So we're going to use about, I would say a tablespoon of miso. And that's gonna give a great umami flavor to the butter. The other thing that we're gonna add is just a little bit of sweetness from honey. Okay. And um, a little bit of savory umami and a couple splashes of soy sauce. And we'll mix that up. And I'm doing this in a bowl, but you could also throw this into your food processor. Okay. So how, how, how well does it have to be mixed? Well, we want it to be completely homogenous. And this is the kind of thing that um, this miso butter is great just to have on hand. Um, it's great in this recipe, but it, you can use it in, you know, in, a, in a risotto, you could pull it out um, and um, it just could add flavor to a lot of different dishes. Okay. So it's the kind of thing where it's great to make it and then freeze it stores really well there and you just uh, cut off a piece when you need to use it. I like the idea of putting in a risotto, uh, an extra creaminess layer to it. Yeah, in your, we call it in Italian, the, when you finish the risotto with the butter and cheese, the mantecatura. So you could use this instead of just regular butter. Okay. Okay, pretty much there. And we'll set this aside. All right, so the next thing we're gonna work on um, is uh, our mushrooms and our seaweed. Uh, so here I have a little bit of dulse, which is, uh, some people call it the bacon of the, of the sea. Uh, it has that kind of, um, it's definitely salty and has a little bit of a, um, that meaty flavor. Okay. So I'm just going to add a touch of uh, extra virgin olive oil to our pan. And we're going to fry up that dulse, give it a little bit of uh, crispness. And you're using uh, shiitake mushrooms as well? Or? That's right. These are, I love to use shiitake. Uh, they're just, they have a great meaty flavor. Um, they have a nice texture, uh, but you could use really any mushroom would work with this dish. You talked about, about, about growing it. Uh, yeah. One thing that I've noticed is that it's not really utilized a lot right. in the United States. Right. So why isn't it used as much? And how yeah. do we get to that point where we right. make it more of a staple food? Yeah. And I think unfamiliarity has to be the main reason why, pe why it doesn't get used very much. Um, it's in the odd foods section in the grocery store, typically. Uh, and so people who are eating it, it's because it's part of their cultural tradition. And so it's, whether it's the Japanese tradition or the Eastern European tradition uh, or from other countries, uh, that just people are used to eating it because their families did. Uh, the other reason people do it is because it's the gluten-free food, and so many people need to eat gluten-free food, so they discovered it because for health reasons. Yeah. Uh, but otherwise, the uh, popularity of new and different things is coming on. That's definitely a food trend now, and I think that's playing a significant role in bringing it uh, into more... Uh, applications, more people are discovering it that way. Yeah. It's still quite a bit more expensive than a lot of other grains, so that will definitely play into people's thinking when uh, replacing something that they eat a lot of. But, I, but you're right, I do notice that, in, and Jessica's doing the same thing here, that uh, people are experimenting more with, I know it's not a grain, but different types of, yeah. of plants and grains yeah. that maybe are ancient or they're not used right. to, to get a different profile, yeah. different characteristic. And the, the ancient grain uh, concept 
uh, is definitely having a moment. Yeah. Uh, so many different ancient grains and buckwheat is definitely part of that conversation. Yeah. Okay, let's see how we're doing. The shiitake is moving. So you took the <laughs> seaweed out. It's nice so and crispy. I, I, yeah, I fried up just a, in a little bit of extra virgin olive oil and you take it out just when it starts to turn. You can see it kind of, it goes from the kind of uh, maroon uh, color to a, a more of a green starts to show up and it gets nice and crispy. So we don't want to burn it, so we take it out at that point. Okay. Um, and that's going to be kind of a garnish. And in, into this, I've added a little bit of our um, miso butter. Right. We're using this to uh, sort of saute these mushrooms. So we just want to get a little bit of color on those. And one thing about this dish, because of the seaweed uh, and because of the miso, um, it has a lot of salinity already, so I'm probably not going to need to add any salt here. Okay. But you can you can taste it. Once you the can mushrooms, smell it. Uh, yeah. It's coming through the creaminess and. Once the mushrooms get a little bit of golden uh, color, I'm going to add in our. Um, we have some sliced uh, scallions here, so those will go in, and these just take a little bit of time to wilt down. The other ingredient that we have uh, for this recipe is um, are our beans. Okay. Um, and these, uh, the beans that we're using for this particular uh, recipe, these are called um, Christmas lima beans. Uh, they have other names as well, uh, but I love them because they have this beautiful sort of uh, deep speckled color. Mm -hmm. um, so this dish is sort of a study in, in different color browns. Um, so the kind of speckled, uh, nature of this bean i think gives a nice visual appeal but yeah. you could again use any bean here i like to use a big a bigger bean though for these okay. like a gigante um works really well as, as well so and that kind of gives it a very hearty <laughs> then a hearty uh, flavor to it yes. having the beans and these beans are already cooked so i can add them right into the pan and i'm going to add a little bit of the bean cooking liquid because we don't want to uh, lose any of those vitamins. And we'll give that a, a nice toss. Turn that down just to a simmer. Um, we're gonna finish it with a little of our, more of our miso butter and we'll uh, garnish it with our seaweed. And I did, I did add a little bit of salt into the pasta cooking water. And then why do you uh, put salt in, it, in the water? Um, to season the pasta. Like some people will season the pasta water. Some people put uh, salt in their pasta dough. I tend not to season the dough. Uh, I season the water and then I season the sauce or whatever it's going to cook in. Pasta is like a sponge. It absorbs uh, flavors. So if you, if you season either your pasta cooking water or the sauce, the, the pasta is going to absorb that as well. So okay. I don't feel like I need to add more salt into the dough. Okay. Um, I'm going to add a little bit of the pasta cooking water, or you could add a little bit more of the bean cooking water here. You also want to be careful too when you um, when you use a, a the bean cooking liquid uh, for a sauce. You want to remember that 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 bean cooking liquid also was seasoned. So if this sauce continues to reduce and reduce and reduce, you're just concentrating that salinity. Right. So uh, that's just something to keep in mind. And this pasta, because it's so fresh is only going to take about a minute or two to um, to come up to the boil or sorry to come up to the surface and it'll be cooked and I always say with with fresh pasta what you want to do is you want to cook it uh, you cook it in the water but you always want to finish it in your sauce oh, okay. so it always um, if you need to pull it out a minute or so uh, before it's like al dente especially in the case of like a dried pasta because this is fresh it's not ever really al dente um, then you want to always finish to cook it in your sauce. Do you still wait for it to rise then, or do you wait maybe a little bit before then yeah, to put it in? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it depends how much, uh, how much time you have to finish it there. Okay. Because <laughs> that looks ready, right? This is ready. Yeah, we're good. And we're, we're making basically like an emulsion here. So um, what we're, we're trying to do is balance the fat from the miso butter and the liquid either from the beans or from the cooking uh, from the pasta cooking water. I, I think we're good. I'm gonna put these in. Okay. And those will finish to cook in the pan. And then when do you add the seaweed? At the end? That's gonna be our garnish. Garnish, got yep. it. Okay. 
So crispy so topping. So toss, um, and we have soft pasta, we have really tender beans. It's nice to have a kind of crisp accompaniment. All right, so we're gonna go in with more of our butter to kind of finish it off. And if you were, for instance, wanting to make this uh, dairy-free, you could um, just use miso and uh, even puree uh, some of the beans to give it a thick, mm. thicker quality, okay. or you could use another fat. Um, whoops. And when you puree the beans, you do that after you've soaked them? After you cook them. After you cook them? Yep. Okay. okay. So I'm looking to make sure all of my beans really are nicely smelly. coated. It smells great over here. Yeah. A <laughs> little bit more. That should be good and we're ready to plate up. Okay, that sounds good. Gonna make sure you get a little bit of everything. Yeah, I want the buckwheat and beans combination. Buckwheat you know. and beans. So this is the bacon of the sea, not the chicken of the sea, but the, <laughs> the bacon, bacon of, of the, the sea. sea. And dulse is really good, is really good for you nutritionally. So um, has a lot of uh, vitamins and minerals that the, so you don't have to take your supplement. Perfect. Just eat more seaweed. Okay. This is pretty simple to make at home. I mean, it's uh, probably the longest thing is just rolling Making out the, the pasta. pasta. Yeah. And you could also buy pasta. So right. the other thing I was going to mention, if you want that buckwheat flavor, but you don't want to make the pasta, um, there are a lot. There are some um, buckwheat dried pastas that you can make like soba that would work really well in this dish. Soba would be perfect here. Um, or you could use a, a whole wheat pasta would be nice. Um, so lots of options. Okay. Let's dive in. All right, oh, let's let me get my, my seaweed yes, here. Yes, be garnished. All right, tell me what you mm -hmm. think. Mm. I love it with the butter. Very rich flavors. Mm -hmm. Really a lot I love the Christmas lima with this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It has a, gives so it a nice. kind of chestnut mm -hmm. flavor that works well with the uh, buckwheat. Yeah. Yeah, steady in brown flavors too, but they're not muddled. They're distinctive. And, yes. And it's not heavy. The, it's yeah, despite fresh as the well, fact that we so, yeah. used uh, <laughs> almost a half a stick of butter. <laughs> <laughs> Don't think about that. And the lemon just. It's gives a nice it a bright, bright note. Yeah. But the buckwheat, too, it does give it a nice heartiness to it, to the pasta. So Jessica and Thomas, thank you very much for joining me today. Um, and thank you, the Arboretum, for hosting this wonderful event. If you'd like to learn about the Arboretum, about the hospitality program uh, at Montgomery College, or the research that ARS is doing on buckwheat, we'll have all the links at the end of this video. Check it out. And until next time, uh, I'm Todd Silver with Cooking with Science. Thanks for joining us.